on today's story beat. In every case, when we design scenery, like for when we're going on the road or we're celebrating some theme on the stage um, and in Culver City, where we normally shoot, the whole idea is we want to create something to make the audience want to go there. When we're on the road, I want to pick the biggest icons and the funnest things to see so that, and represent those on stage so that someone watching the show will go, boy, I, I need to go there. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, noted production designer Renee Haas Johnson, watched her mother create colorful gardens in their backyard and paint beautiful still life pictures. Her high school drama teacher noticed that Renee loved to draw and asked her to design her first set for an upcoming school play, and so began a lifelong career in stage and production design. Working with a local theater group led to several positions at community and regional theaters. She first attended the Pacific Conservatory of the Performing Arts in Santa Maria, California, followed by Cal Arts, which led to a long period of nurturing her talents at Walt Disney Imagineering. While at Disney, Renee worked on projects for Epcot Center, Tokyo Disneyland, and the New Fantasyland at Disneyland in Anaheim, California. After leaving Disney, Renee filled in as an assistant art director at NBC Television on various game shows and soap operas until production designer Richard Stiles hired her to help out full-time on Wheel of Fortune. Renee has been with Wheel of Fortune for nearly 36 years and took over as the production designer when Richard retired in 2002. Beyond Wheel of Fortune, since 1989, Renee has designed award-winning floats for the popular annual New Year's Day Pasadena Tournament of Roses Parade. And in her free time, like her mother, she loves to create magical gardens for everyone to enjoy. For the record, Renee and I have been friends since working together on the creation of Epcot Center more years ago than either of us will admit to. So for me, this is a truly great joy and a real delight to have my longtime friend, the terrifically talented Renee Haas Johnson, as my guest on Story Beat today. Renee, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. Good to see you. It's been a while. It's been a while. So it's, it is great to see you. So let's talk about where all of this began. We already heard that um, you started to design when you were in high school because someone asked you to. But when did you start drawing? When did you start looking at art as something that you liked to do? How old were you? I would say I was probably about um, 14. I didn't actually know I could draw. And I sketched a little bit here and there, but I wasn't, I didn't believe in myself. So when I got to college and I decided to start doing that, I wanted to do set designs and things like that. Basically, I just dove in and it was really at that point that I realized I had the talent to do it. And, and um, so was you were what, 18, 19 before you thought to yourself, you know what, I actually can do this a little bit? Yes. When I started, uh, once I was in high school and I did one or two shows, my mom realized I really liked it. And I started in regional theater um, doing uh, at the San Jose Civic Light Opera. And after that, my mom realized that I really enjoyed it. I wasn't designing sets at that time. I was a crew person. And, um, you know, just a stage hand or helping with a follow spot or this or that. But she realized that I really had a love for it. So every summer she would take me to the Pacific Conservatory of the Performing Arts to see their shows. Mm -hmm. And we would drive down from San Jose, California uh, to Santa Maria. We would stay one or two days and we would see two to at least two to three shows a day. And um it was really a lot of fun. And she realized that I really loved it. And the amazing thing that she did for me that to this day, I still thank her for is she 
talked with the facility there to see if I could stay and watch them change sets over. Mm. They would do one set in the afternoon. They had two facilities. One was in Solvang and one was in Santa Maria. Right. And the shows would go between the two locations. And what would happen is after they did one show in the afternoon, an entire crew of people would come over or come out, take the entire show down, load it on trucks and put, put up basically a whole different show for the evening. So you were saying so, it's a major turnover early on in your life. You were seeing how that worked. Yes. And seeing how they took sets apart and how it trucked. And we would go around to the side of the theater and watch how they were loading trucks. It was a really amazing experience. Would you say that 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 you saw then um, has held you in good stead throughout your whole career? Is, is that something that really majorly influenced you? Most definitely, uh, I would say yes. And because of that, when I got out of high school, the first place I went um, and luckily was able to be accepted to was their summer program at the Pacific Conservatory of the Performing Arts, which was an elite group of people. They brought in top name performers from all over the country. They had um, production designers that were on hiatus from doing motion pictures in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. They had top of the line scenic artists. So it gave me a chance to really work and watch masters um, at their, in their fields. And um, I truly believe that that's what started this whole. Do, do you feel, um, do you feel like you, you were soaking that in that it was like really fascinating to you and you wanted to know more about it? Is that how that worked? Yes, but I will say that doing the summer stock first before I actually joined the school program, to me, was, was really what drove it home because mm -hmm. I was able to work with the top people in my field at that point. During the, sum, during the summer program, because they brought in such talented professionals, it was very different from the school year. The school year was wonderful, too. But during the school year, all of those top professionals went back to working in Los Angeles or on films or TV or to New York or wherever. So they still had very talented people there, don't get me wrong. But you, you were in classes and you, it wasn't so fast paced as it was during the summer. In the summer on my lunch hour, I would run down um, and watch them paint the floors and I would watch, uh, be able to run over and see how they were making specialty props out of foam and using resin and other chemicals and processes that I had never been witnessed, never had a chance to witness before. Wow, that, that's, that was really cool to you, wasn't it? It was really cool. And everything was so close because everything was happening so fast. During the school year, all of the spaces they would use during the summer became classrooms. So mm -hmm. The costumers all moved much farther away than they are during the summer. The prop department would be in a totally different area, much farther away. And so because of that, when you'd have a small break, you couldn't just run over and see what people were doing. I'll tell you the most important thing to me, and I've done since very, very early on, is whenever I had a break or an opportunity to jump in and watch somebody, if they didn't mind, I'd watch them do renderings. I would watch them draft. I would watch people painting sets or aging scenery. And all of that, it's amazing how much of a sponge you become, even though you might not realize it at the time. You really take all of that in. And in my case, that was almost more important than going to school. Mm -hmm. Well, it, usually it turns out to be that practical work is infinitely better than an, an academic education, though I think academic educations are really great for foundation and also for uh, training you on how to interact with people and collaborate and do all those other things that school's great for. But working, there's no substitute for really just doing it. Everybody knows that. Uh, so at some point, I mean, you were drawing through this whole time, right? You were still drawing. That's something you've always done. Yes. And because I, you know, I've seen lots of your drawings and you're an, an immaculate artist. I mean, your drawings are just phenomenal. And at some point you got hired at, at Disney, at Walt Disney Imagineering a little bit before I did, but you were there, um, working in the special effects department, um, or I guess it was the, I guess we call it the special effects department. What, 
Um, what were you doing there? Tell the listeners what you were doing for Disney Imagineering. Well, let me preface that just a little bit. I was working at CalArts. I was going to school at CalArts, and I do want to say that, yes, I will tell you that acad the academic side, I needed that as much as I needed everything else, sure, and it really did make me a whole person. But while I was at CalArts, Disney Imagineering um, had what they called a um, co-op for students where you could get hired and get credit for working there. And I signed up for it and um, they brought me in for an interview. And the first thing they said to me is, have you ever taken a car apart and put it together? Have you ever taken a toaster apart or a or a, a phone or anything and learn how heck it works. hasn't taken a toaster apart? <laughs> well, technically for me, I had done none of that. And they kept asking me why I was there because I wasn't mechanical. And I said, well, I'm an artist. That's really what I do. And I design scenery and that kind of thing. And at first, I really didn't think they were going to hire me. But at that point, they had a holography lab. And the holography lab was doing very large probably six by eight foot holograms. Um, and they were learning how to do holograms and they needed someone to design the sets that they shot and to help create all of the things that went into that mm -hmm. um, hologram. And so because of that, they said, gosh, maybe, maybe we could use her in there. And um, so they hired me. And once they hired me, they realized that if they could utilize me to do renderings and sketches that they could as a department hand over to the production designers for the park, they might get a jump ahead. And so what happened was I ended up doing a lot of renderings for them and they found out that it would speed up the time of their projects greatly because they could design four or five things and take that to a designer that doesn't have time to to design them but the designer would say oh i like this one this one and this one go for it let's go ahead with that and so that's kind of how i got hired Exp and the um, listeners what a hologram is a hologram <laughs> briefly <laughs> a hologram is a picture a 3d picture made with lasers mm -hmm. and um it's uh it's boy they're all shot in the dark and um, I got to be honest, I don't know all the technical. Well, you don't, parts I don't need the technical details, just the, ge the gist of it, which is that you are able, a, a person is able to look at a hologram, which is usually on plastic or some kind of medium, and it looks three dimensional because it's been shot with lasers and it captures the whole, the whole, all three, all three sides of it, all four sides of it. Yes, I agree. So if you were to walk by it from the right to the left, just like on a window, you were mm -hmm. walking past the window. And you can see that if there was a car outside the window and you were, walked from the right to the left, you would, and you could see around the car, you could do the same thing in a hologram. Uh, in one of the holograms we designed, um, I put in a magnifying glass and the magnifying glass actually worked. You could walk by the magnifying glass and see what was magnified behind. Where'd that go in the uh, imagination? Yes. That was Fig Figment had the magnifying glass, right? Yes, you've got a good memory. Yeah, Very good. Mm -hmm. And um, none of the none of the holograms we did at that time are still around. Uh, technology has moved so vastly that um, you can get the same effect in a much less expensive way today. Well, sure. So because of that, well, they that, don't. You know, that was back in the Pleistocene era. <laughs> we won't say how long ago. No, the long, other thing but about it was a while. <laughs> The other thing about the holograms is they're not full color. They were, if you used um, argon lasers, they were one color. So you would have either red holograms or blue holograms or green holograms, mm -hmm. but the whole image was green. So that took a little bit away. The, the largest hologram we did in Epcot years ago was in the Imagination Pavilion, the largest one. And it was a deep thoughts tank. And uh, we had fish swimming around that were uh, basically mathematical symbols in the shape of fish. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a whole bunch of different things going within it. So as the, the, um, the person was driving by in their car, 
they would get the idea that this was kind of a, a thought tank where things were coming together and being created. Mm, very, very good. All right. So we're going to move beyond Disney because that is, you know, that was sort of the beginning of things for you, I have no doubt. And at some point you go over to NBC to work, you know, in their art department. I assume it was their art department. Um, did you already, were you already a fan of game shows and soap operas before you went over there? Or was that just something that you just got assigned to do? It was something I got assigned to do. The difference at the time with NBC, other than any other studio, whether it was television or film at that time, is that NBC had four or five, they had a whole series of soap operas and game shows that were set. But then they had a group of floating assistant art directors that would work on all the different shows as needed. If someone was sick, somebody would move over and fill in. So they had two or three, what they would call floating art directors. And those art directors, let's say someone, one of the art directors was, had to leave on maternity leave or, or someone had a family emergency and had to leave, they would fill in. So I was able to work on many, many shows. Every day was something different. Um, and then at some point, um, uh, Dick Stiles with uh, Wheel of Fortune had an opening and asked me if I wanted to, to come aboard with him. And I had already done the show. I knew the show pretty much inside and out at that point. Right. Um, I was doing Sale of the Century. I was doing The Tonight Show, um, uh, a, a variety of different soap operas from Days of Our Lives um, and uh, Santa Barbara. And so I really, and Dick and I got along really well. And so I thought, well, okay, maybe it's time to make a change and go on Wheel of Fortune full time. When, when, you, when you were working there, much like up in at PCPA, uh, you were soaking all that in, weren't you? You were learning and learning and learning because you were always getting something new thrown at you. Is that true? That is true. And because as a floating art director or floating assistant art director, excuse me, um, the thing about it is you were always running prints to the shop. You were always going down to check with the scenic department on different techniques and getting samples made. Um, you were always running out to, to pick up props. So you got to learn all the, where all the prop houses were. You got to learn where everything was. Um, you'd have to order things to be picked up by transportation. So you got to, to learn all the different uh, people in the trucking department. It, it was an amazing thing because by the time I moved up to be on, on Wheel of Fortune permanently, I knew the whole studio. I knew everybody in the studio. I knew where every division was. I knew so many people because I'd worked on so many shows that it actually made my job extremely easy well, or you, appear that way. Let's say appear that way. <laughs> well, well, you, you know, I know you well enough to know that, um, you make it look easy, though there's a lot of work involved and many hours that go into it. But the, but what you're talking about, which I think is important for the listeners to understand, is that you got an education in many different um, departments and aspects of production at a television center. This In this case, it's NBC. And so you learned how all those different things interacted and who was where so that as you rolled into Wheel of Fortune, you were already sort of set up to just do things. Yes? Yes. And I think and that's then, really, really important to understand that, that doing all those things is very useful. Well, the one thing is, is that I wanted to get in the door and I never cared if I was hired as a scenic artist, a follow spot operator, it didn't matter. I dove in and learned every department wherever I was. I talked to people. I learned anything that I could because if you have a drive to go somewhere, it doesn't matter which way you go. There's 25, 30, hundreds of different directions on how to get there. But all of it helps you make that jump to where you want to be. And mm -hmm. you might find along the way that you actually want to go in a different direction. You like something more. So yeah, for me, it, I mean, the truth of the matter is, which I don't know if I ever told you this, Steve, I actually started out wanting to be a lighting designer. <laughs> no. And it was funny because you were a lighting designer. Yes. And, but what happened was along the way, it wasn't enough for me. I, 
I was drafting the same little lighting instruments, but in different positions all over a piece of paper. And it didn't, it didn't excite me as much because I needed, I needed more color. I needed, I just needed more excitement and more to do. You not like that the, you like the three dimensionality of things. Right. And it's not that I was bored or anything. I just, it wasn't enough for me. And so by the, by going to scenery, I learned how to paint scenery. I learned how to draft scenery. I need, learned how to do models. There was so much more for me to do. Mm -hmm. And that made me happy. <laughs> so that's why I ended up in uh, doing set it, design. And to this day, I, I mean, every day is a dream. Would, I mean, would I, you say that's what fascinates you about production design is that, the, that it's, it's all these various, it's, it's both uh, mechanical, it's physical, it's also color, it's all those things. Is that what fascinates you about production design? Yes. And because every day is something new. Every day there's a new hurdle to overcome. Every day there's, whether you're doing an on location set and you're just enhancing what's there, or if you, when we were on location at the Hilton Waikoloa, they took us out to this area on the beach and said, well, what do you think about this? And I said, well, we'd have to redo all the landscape. We'd have to bring bulldozers in here and clear this all out, but yeah, I can make this work. And they said to me, well, can you make it work in such a way that we could do weddings out here later? And I said, yeah, I can make that all work. <laughs> so it's just so much put together. And to me, every adventure is just that much more exciting. And so we had so much fun doing all these fun things. So you welcome the challenges. You like the challenges. Yes. And the, the big thing is, is that I don't let it get to me. I, if I don't get stressed over it. I take a deep breath and I just think and I go, okay, I'm going to, if, if the project's too big and you're, it's overwhelming, you just take a little piece of it and you start with the first thing you have to do first. And then it expands and expands and expands and gets bigger and bigger. But if you just do every little piece at a time. And so I've learned to not get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I've been extremely lucky over the years to have incredible team working with me. And you are truly as good as the people that work for you. So who, who so, do you think was your major influence? Was it Dick Stiles? Was he the major influence in your, in your overall career? Or was it someone else? It was a gentleman by the name of Jim Clater. He was the production designer on Family Ties. And um, he... Uh, he got introduced to me along the way and he would let me just go sit in his office on the Paramount lot and he would let me just watch him. He would take me to the shops. He would take me everywhere. He showed me how to do perspective drawings and sketches. He talked me through the fact that we are there to design for our producers and our directors. It's our ideas, but it's our job to make their dreams come true mm -hmm. so that, and he taught me probably the most important lesson I could have ever learned in my career. And that lesson was that if you work real hard and you design something and you present it to someone and they don't like it, you should never be upset. You should never feel bad just because their vision is different from yours. Doesn't mean that they don't like your work. They don't like you they just wanted to go in a different direction and no matter what you design for them will get you closer to what they want mm -hmm. and so i have never gotten upset if someone doesn't like what i've done it's not that they're criticizing what i'm doing it's just they had a different vision it's it's and frequently can, it's frequently a taste issue their taste yes is and different. it's a personal thing design is personal if you might want your home to have an industrial look uh, the next person might want something contemporary. The person after that might want something totally modern and totally out of the box. So when I design for people, I normally, if it's a brand new set that, uh, let's say a, a brand new, just stationary game show set, I will normally do two or three options. I try to never do more than three designs for anything. Um, 
because at a point you get to where there's too much design work for them to look at and they get confused. Yeah, they get confused. It's, it's better to give them less choices, but some choices. What is a, a standing set? What are you talking about when you're talking using terms like that? A standing set would be like, for example, Jeopardy. If you looked at the game show Jeopardy, if you looked at Family Feud, a lot of those game shows have what we would call a standing set. The set doesn't change day to day or week to week. Uh, they might do some small modifications if it's a celebrity show or it's celebrating the NBA or something like that. But the set itself is, I would call, a standing set. On Wheel of Fortune, we change the set every week. Every single every... week. you For each five shows, you have a whole different look. Right. One, one week might be the California coast. So we celebrate... California. And so we might have the um, Golden Gate Bridge on one side of the set and the Hotel Delphs and uh, the Coronado Bridge on the other side of the set going from San Diego to San Francisco. Um, if it's, let's say it's, uh, we're celebrating Hawaii, we would have Hawaiian huts and uh, kahilis and tropical plants everywhere. Um, we do do, a, we do have what we would call our generic set with, which is a singular set that we use on occasion. Um, well, but the, the wheel is still the wheel unless you upgrade it, but the wheel remains the wheel, right? Right. The wheel, the puzzle board, and the bonus unit and our little center video wall do not change. Mm -hmm. But everything else around them does. So all of the set pieces that I design have to work with what we would call a standalone or generic set as well as with anything else that they could dream up. Um, the show tends to do, we actually do go on the road on a regular basis. And um, we have, luckily I've been on every one we've ever done. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> except for the very first one, I prepped it, but I didn't go on it because the very first show that we did was in New York. And I was so young at the time, they weren't sure how the stagehands would handle that. So. Um, I did not go on that one. But because when we do go on the road, we represent that city or that state that we're going to. If I'm going to New York, I would want to represent New York at its best. So we normally take a trip out to that city, me and my uh, uh, assistant art director slash uh, set designer, Jody Vaclav, we would take a trip out and see everything that that city has to offer. Mm -hmm. Um, and we probably could do it on the internet, but we always like to see people around and see what people like. We look at everything that city has to offer in the day as well as in the night so that we get an idea if we want to do a night look or a day look. So you're doing and actual location scouting and you're, um, you're, you're doing research by actually going to the location. Yes. Yes. And, and, yes. And what other and, research, what other research do you tend to do? Well, it depends on what I'm designing, but in for Wheel of Fortune, if we're going on location, I always do research again on the internet as well as in person for the city we're going to, because a lot of the cities change on a regular basis. Their skylines change. Every, you 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 don't always know if what you're looking at on the internet is current. Mm -hmm. If it is for a, a rose parade float or something like that, I would do research into animals if I'm going to have a cat on the float or a mouse or some other character I would do research so that I I know that I'm drawing things that are that are correct that I proportions and everything are correct um and and how, I, how does traveling to different locations then complicate your work it's obviously more time to figure out what it is you're doing but how does it become complicated for you? I'm sure it becomes enor an enormous task to no longer be in the studio, correct? Yes. The big thing about Wheel of Fortune over any other show I've ever done, whether it was a traveling theater show or anything, is that Wheel of Fortune is larger than most concerts, touring shows, because when we travel, we take about 150 staff and we hire uh, about 125 people out of the city we're going to. Wow. As, as a production designer, if you're in film, it's a different story, but in television, uh, 
the art department's responsibilities are very different from film. And so when we go on the road, I'm responsible for drafting and, and doing the layouts for where everything would go from offices for the production to dressing rooms, to where the power is gonna be located. If we wow. bring in, in power, we bring in about 14 semi-trucks and basically where everything goes, where the audience goes, we all the drapery, even down to trash bins. You, we're you, responsible. You're, you're responsible for all that? Now we're responsible for the location of it. We don't order it. Um, we, I, I oversee the bleacher rentals. And if we're on an exterior uh, venue, the entire roof system is specified by us. And I and my team work with the company that's going to be installing that because there's permits required. There's so much stuff that is required. And in a lot of cases, we actually have to hire a company to go out and survey things so that we make sure that we're not going to drill down and affect something in the ground on mm -hmm. the location where we are. Well, you sure wouldn't want to drill into a gas line or, or an electric line or something like that. Well, I could tell you a really funny story if you don't mind breaking sure, away. Sure, go, go for it. When we were at the Hilton Waikoloa, which I talked about earlier, which was a huge area that we, they asked us to excavate for the show and for future weddings for them. Their head of facilities came out and I said, you know, the one thing we don't have is any as-built drawings of where your sewer, water, gas, all your large lines are out here. And he goes, you know what? We don't have that, but you're not going to find anything. And I said, well, what do you mean we're not going to find anything? So my assistant, Jody Vaclav, is a water witch. And I don't know if you know what a water witch is, but it's where you can take two little pieces of wood or metal and thin metal and hold them out and they will they will cross over and make a V where there's a water line. Well, I'd never heard of that, but she's walking around checking this on. She goes, there's like a major something right here. And I said, well, you know, they're saying there's nothing out here. And we were shaving off two inches of dirt at a time. We filled, I think it was 26 large dump trucks getting dirt out of there. That's how much stuff we took out of there but we weren't sure what we were gonna hit. And we were worried about gas lines, we we're worried about sewer, we we're worried about everything. So the, um, the head of facilities comes out and he goes, you know, just don't worry about it. You're not gonna hit anything. Don't worry about it. And only call me if there's a major disaster. You don't need to call me about anything. But within 15 minutes, we hit the main water line right where Jody said it was. We had a 40, 40 to 50 foot spout going off a geyser it was a geyser it was so funny and uh, he comes and he goes i don't believe this all the construction <laughs> we've done on this property nobody's ever hit anything you guys are here for you know 15 minutes <laughs> <laughs> so they turned off the water line and we went through i mean he wasn't worried about we weren't worried about sprinkler lines and stuff like that because they had turned those off but uh, it was a lot of fun. And so, you know what? All I can tell people is along the way, you're going to find a lot of things that, you, that are basically, you know, stop you in your tracks. But you just have to understand, just take a deep breath. And there's always a way to solve it. And if mm -hmm. you can't solve it, find someone to help you. There are always people around that would be more than happy to help you. And some of the people you've met along the way, if you have to make a phone call, they'll help you as well. Well, it probably helps a great deal that you're a very popular show and a very famous show. And everybody's heard of Wheel of Fortune. Who's not heard of Wheel of Fortune? So it probably helps because then they think, oh, I'm really helping out a great, you know, famous show. And that so if you came along and it was just Renee, um, you know, digging in the sand because she felt like digging in the sand, they might be upset with you but they're willing to bend over backwards because you're a famous <laughs> show. I want to go back half a step. You talked about drafting. I want to talk about drafting for a moment because I think it's important. When you started in the business, it was all on paper. You had the drafting table and you everything was on paper. How much of what you do today is still on paper and how much of it is in the computer? Well, I would say that 90% of my initial sketching, which is not drafting, but just sketching yep. is done on paper. For drafting, you 
At first, I loved working on paper and I thought it was great. When I got to NBC, they had just started teaching all of their people AutoCAD. Um, AutoCAD uh, is a, a program used by a lot of people, mostly architectural firms and um, uh, that kind of thing um, for larger, larger buildings and that and uh, projects. But we learned on AutoCAD. So I have worked in AutoCAD my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, what I find on AutoCAD is it's one of those programs that has millions of different commands. But if you know 25 or 30 of them, you can really do anything. And so for me, on Wheel of Fortune, we draw everything full size because it allows you to draw it full size. Um, then what we'll do wait, is- Wait, wait we'll a minute, I wanna back up on that. You draw it full size. You're not actually drawing your set in actual scale, are you? Yes, in AutoCAD, we draw every, if, if, if something's gonna be 25 feet high, we draw it 25 feet high. Really? Then when we print it, we'll scale it. But unlike most, most people that I know don't draw that way, um, we draw that way so that we can get an idea of what it's gonna be. Um, we, our studio um, drawings are drawn full size. And because we go into these enormous venues like uh, Radio City Music Hall, the Grand Old Opry, the um, Superdome, and we've gone to so many of these large facilities, all of their drawings are in AutoCAD. So mm. we have always worked on that program. I know that a lot of uh, designers work in SketchUp and Vectorworks. Um, and now those programs, uh, we can bring those programs into ours, at least their drawings and work with them. But um, for me, we've always worked full size. Now, the cool thing about that is, is that when we are going, let's say to Seattle and we had to draw the Space Needle, we were able to find drawings of the Space Needle and we drew it full size, but then scaled it down to the size we needed it. But we were able to, um, the Empire State Building, a lot of those very famous icons, you can actually get blueprints for. Wow, that's interesting. So that really helps us out a lot. When we did um, Boston, I wanted to do the um, Old North Church. And so we were having a problem because when we went out on location to look at it, it's sandwiched so closely between other buildings, we couldn't even get in there to measure it. And we found out that in um, Forest Lawn Cemetery out in, um, in Los Angeles here, they have an exact replica of the Old North Church. <laughs> so we were able to go out there and take a bunch of measurements and look at everything. And it actually worked out really well. But once we put it in the computer, the scale of it didn't quite work for us. So what I did is I, because it's an AutoCAD and because it was on the computer, I could save the entire drawing or the entire building that we drew off to the side. And then I started playing with squishing and squashing certain elements so that I could get it down to a reasonable size that we could put on stage. Um, and so it allowed me to look at, to literally have a full size one right next to where I was working and I could manipulate it. So it really had the same exact feel Mm -hmm. but I could make it so that it worked on stage and worked with our camera shots and everything else. And that made it extremely helpful. Wow. Um, the floats per se that I do, I still do all by hand. All the renderings are uh, three by five feet and, um, or a or slightly smaller depending on the float. And those are still all painted by hand and uh, with markers, well, acrylics. We'll, we'll, we'll get to floats in a moment because I'm fascinated by those too. And that, that, that's also a part of your, your whole thing throughout your life. Um, you, I think you are well known for um, designing and building very elaborate and detailed looking sets, especially for a game show. Your stuff is very lush and detailed and elaborate. Where did that come from? Where have you always thought that way? Have you always enjoyed the elaborateness of, of I guess, design? I just always wanted to be able to create something that people would bring people in. And uh, years ago, um, Dick Styles, we were doing a, a garage sale set, and um, I don't know. They wanted. I don't remember why it was called garage sale. I. <laughs> 
but we had to, but I want, he asked me if I wanted to design it. So I designed three little houses and um, we don't have a lot of room on the stage. So they are, two of them were two story houses and one was a single story house. And uh, but they not basically full, not, full, not full scale. No, no, they were, <laughs> no, they were quarter scale. But the thing is, is that they were about six feet deep and about 18 feet high at the highest points. Mm -hmm. And um, when they were building them in the shop, they didn't look quite right. So I went out to a hardware store and I got some vents and this and that and little things to put on it. And I got um, some hose reels and stuff. And it just made it all come to life. And I, I just, my whole life, I have just loved detail. I think that makes things so much more realistic and it brings you in. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I, I have to cut back and, and step back because some of that on television, the way we shoot it doesn't show. If you're doing a soap opera, you know, a character might pick up a cup or, you know, sit down and eat or picks up the phone and you need something around the phone that looks creative for them that would be there. How, how long did it take you? How long did it take you to learn th this is going to work and show and this is a I don't need this. It's it's a waste because the camera's not going to see it. How long did it take you to kind of learn that? Uh, not very long because when you're working your way up and you're in a bunch of different uh, positions, for me, I was uh, as the uh, floating art director, I was or assistant art director, I was always the one that would be in the booth while during rehearsals. So I would get a really good idea of what people would see and what they wouldn't. On Wheel of Fortune, I mean, well, let me go back. On a soap opera, again, they're going into the set. They want you to be as if you're living and doing what this person is. Sure. They want you to see everything around them and, and literally feel like you're in the room. So you need a lot more detail. Um, on wheel, the number one most important thing is gameplay. It's the wheel and it's that puzzle board. So everything else is secondary. So I want enough to make it realistic, but I don't want to go so far that it's lost well, and I, that a I, lot of I, money is spent. Whenever I watch the show, I always smile because I think of you in my head as the queen of green. I mean, you use greenery more than or better than just about anybody else I've ever seen. You always have plants and you've always got greenery. And I'm sure that you use it to mask certain things too, but that the greenery just sort of makes the whole thing come alive. It feels like you're in a living world. Uh, it does. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I, you know, I grew up with my mom who created these magical gardens and which is what I do, I love to do in my spare time today, but I love plants. Now, if you were actually on the set of wheel, you would realize when I put plants in, if you took any one plant out, there'd be a hole. I, I know the stage so well now that I could in my head as, because I actually go down and pull every and tag every plant. So, so, you, so you do use it as a means of covering, so to speak, you're covering a hole, covering something else. Yeah, but that's secondary to creating the atmosphere you want to present. No, no, no doubt. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just saying that the greenery is very useful because if you do have an empty space or something that you just want to plug in, you are very creative in the way that you use the greens. Yes. And I that yes. And I do try whenever possible, if we're doing spring and there is anything blooming that you would only see in spring, I always bring it in. There's something magical about doing winter sets because of the snow. And I always bring in iridescent fine glitter in two or three different um, sizes that we spread on top just to get that little twinkle. Oh, oh I know you love your glitter. <laughs> <laughs> to me, a little glitter brings a little bit of sparkle to everybody's life. And so your sets, I, I will tell you something. I've never said this to you before. Your sets always look to me like they smell good. <laughs> well, Pat Sajak would agree with you most of the time. <laughs> now, there was one time we were doing a fall set and I brought in glycerin covered fall leaves. <laughs> And the smell was horrid. <laughs> <laughs> did, did Pat say Jack comment on it? Uh, off camera. And then there was another time that 
I brought in garlic bushes in full <laughs> bloom and didn't realize the smell that they would bring with them. So, <laughs> That's hilarious. So a few little mishaps along the way, but you know, our talent is uh, Pat and Vanna are amazing, amazing. Well, they've been doing uh, it for people. a really long time. They are, point. they are a gift to all of us. And I've worked on the show with for so long, and a lot of the people have worked on it for so long that we really are a large family. And um, they have uh, Pat and Vanna have made the show just so wonderful to be on. Um, they are as kind and as nice as you could ever imagine. And they make it an absolute joy to come to work every day. Well, that's lovely. so. Um, so, <laughs> so the comments were obviously made off camera, <laughs> and they weren't made to me directly. They came through our stage manager to me, uh, because while we're shooting, we're not on stage. Um, <laughs> we're off stage, and so, uh, so I, so now I take that all into consideration, and I have for years. This was in the early years, a long, long time who, ago. Who so. sets the themes for each week? Who's the person? Is it the producer? The producers do that. But, uh, the, the, the themes are based on maybe a special sweepstakes we're going to do, or if we're going to a city like New York, we're going on remote, and we're going to be shooting in New York, they may want to do a theme week prior to us going to New York to celebrate the fact that we're going there. They like to celebrate uh, great American cities across the United States. And um, so maybe they'll pick two or three a year that we uh, represent on stage. Um, it's, uh, I have been on wheel so long because it is, I, and I probably have said this two or three times already, it is an absolute pleasure to work with the people we work with. And um, it is just so much fun. Every day is a new adventure and we just all laugh and joke and have such a great time. And I hope people see that on air because it I, is- I think that's obvious. I think it- It you, is a, a gift to be working on the show. I don't think and, the uh, show would have lasted as long as if the whole thing was a you know miserable experience for people to work on. I think you would have been long gone. So I think it has to have been some kind of joy to go to work every day. Um, I am curious- once you have a theme, once you've been given, this is the weekly theme for this week. Do you then think of yourself as a kind of storyteller? Are you then telling a story with the set? I would say yes. Um, in every case, when we design scenery, like for when we're going on the road or we're celebrating some theme on the stage um, and in Culver City, where we normally shoot, the whole idea is we want to create something to make the audience want to go there. When we're on the road, I want to pick the biggest icons and the funnest things to see so that, and represent those on stage so that someone watching the show will go, boy, I, I need to go there. And when we, we do, let's say I did island hopping, an island hopping set on stage. I want people to feel that after they see that boy to think about, gosh, maybe I would want to go on a trip there and look at how fun that could be. And all the, 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 neat things that we can explore and do. So that's kind of what we do. So yes, I would say we are storytellers as best as we can in the in the size of the studio that we have. Well, I, I'm glad to hear you say that. I don't think the size of the studio has anything to do with your ability to tell a story because you can tell a story in a little tiny space if somebody understands that a story is being told. And for someone to understand that a story is being told, the person telling it has to express it in some way that someone knows that can actually receive it as a story. And I think that's, I asked that question because that's what I feel when I see your work is that there are stories being told it's not obvious. Nobody's turning around and Pat Sajak's not turning around and looking at the set and saying to the audience, look at the story that's being told in this set. It, it just, it's just there. And that's the way that it, it should be. All right. So let's move along to this other incredible thing that you do, which is we've already talked about a few times floats, the Pasadena tournament of roses parade floats. Uh, you've, how many have you done? How many years have you worked on floats? Well, from 1989, but how many floats have you actually done? You know, I've never counted them up, but probably 35. 35 floats. All right. So where did that come from? Because when you first started doing them, 
I, I, I looked at you quizzically like floats. What are you doing doing floats? Where'd that come from? Have you always loved floats since you were a kid? Well, you know, what happened was one day I woke up and I, um, I, I guess because I'd watched a movie or someone suggested, you know, making a list of all the things they wanted to do in their life um, or fun things that they, you know, could strive to do. Um, I woke up one morning and was watching the Rose Parade and uh, said, you know what, that's something I would like to do. And so literally, I knew that there was a bunch of self-built floats that there was five or six at the time. And so the next week I called up and- Well, self-built so self -built being that the, the local community would build the float themselves versus hiring a professional float company. That's yes. Okay. And so, um, and because it is what they would consider a self-built or built by a community, they would use a community designer right. or a non-professional designer. And so as it turned out, uh, La Cunada Flint Ridge, their designer was actually, had just left, had just finished the parade and was leaving because he was going to, he worked at Disney Imagineering and he was going to be going to Paris to work on Disney Paris and which hadn't opened yet, but he was going to be working out there. Right. So they said, if I'd like to design it, they'd be more than happy to talk to me about it. And they told me when their design meeting was, and I uh, sketched up a few designs. And um, when they had their meeting, I turned them in and I just sat in the very back, 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 as far back as I could in this library where it was happening. And they had all these sketches up on the, up on the wall. And I, I remember taking note of from way back and I couldn't even tell what they were, but I could, there were four or five, two that were really nicely done in color and two or three that were nicely drawn so that they were much nice. They were much nicer than the little napkin sketches. Someone that didn't know how, who wasn't an artist would draw. And I said, I just said to myself, I don't even need to know what's on the paper. Those are the ones they're going to pick. <laughs> and inevitably they did <laughs> because it makes you realize that sometimes unless people see something, they don't have a vision of what it could be. Oh, I think it's not sometimes. I think it's most of the time. Most people don't have the ability to envision something that you're pitching at them verbally or just a sketch. They can't see the whole thing. They have to, they have to actually see it to understand it. So that's how it all started. And, um, because of Wheel and Wheel's incredibly tough schedule when we are going on the road and everything, years ago when we were doing two or three or sometimes even four remotes a year on top of shooting in the studio, it was just a tremendous amount of work and responsibility. So I would only do one or two floats a year with the Rose Parade because that's all I had time for. Um, doing them for a self-built requires a lot more work as a designer. Um, when you work for a professional, you would give them a concept and sometimes they would have their own people draft it. Sometimes you would draft it, but they have floral people that pick flowers and they have people that paint the float. Um, when you work for a self-built, you have to do a lot more drafting because the people building it, especially if there's characters on it, they don't know what they're building. So every character you have to do every side, you have to do every side view, top, bottom of every character. You have to have a grid behind it so that they can lay out a grid on the ground and sort of figure out what you want. Even though they're extremely talented, all of these people that, that build self-built floats are extremely talented. Because they don't do it as a profession all year long, they might be a little bit slower than the professionals. So you want to give them as much as you can. But once they build the float, as a designer, I would work with their floral people to pick every flower, every flower arrangement. Uh, I would draw the entire float with a marker, mark every color that went in which section. Hmm. And when I did the floats, every face of every character I personally painted. Wow. Because I would want to get the eyes correctly and, and everything. And... Um, and then there would be sketches made of all the floral arrangements so that when all these people in this community come together that only work, you know, part time on these floats, again, extremely talented. 
all volunteers. They're all volunteers. volunteers. And in order to make it, and no one's paid. And in order to make it easier, you want to have as much information as possible. So it was just a tremendous amount of work. And basically from about Thanksgiving until the first of the year, every free moment of my day and night was there. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of stepped back from that a little bit now. Just uh, Why? It's not bone crushing, is it? <laughs> I don't know what it is. I won't say it's because I'm getting older, but uh, <laughs> but climbing up uh, 20 feet on a scaffolding is not as simple as it was back then. <laughs> and so the last few years that I designed floats, uh, my beautiful daughter, Brianne, would go up, who is also an incredibly skilled artist um, uh, by her own right. Um, she would go up and paint them for me. I would do the stuff on the ground and she would go up and do the um, the faces and the eyes for me on the upper levels. Well, that's nice that you have somebody can back you up that you truly trust. Because <laughs> <laughs> you may not, then you may bump into somebody that's a volunteer that may be okay, but you don't necessarily trust them. But Brianne, you definitely trust. So what are the major differences be des between designing a float and designing a set for Wheel of Fortune? There have to be some really significant ones. Aside from one, you we already know you draw on paper versus in AutoCAD, um, and now you're working not with a professional crew. You're working with volunteers. But what are the other differences? How do you do you approach the design in a different way? You have to um, first of all, floats are seen 360 degrees in all directions. Right. Whether it's the top, because you you're going down a parade route and you have people looking from far above. In the stands, you have people that are walking right down low next to it. For and, judging. The cam and the cameras are high, too. And the cameras are high, too. So, And you're also working on a chassis. The self-builts don't have an opportunity to build a different chassis every single year. So they have the chassis is the, the actual moving steel and driver compartment and et cetera that, are, that make the float move. And so because of that, you have to design around all that. You have to make sure that there's room for, they, they put in people that are, that just basically watch to make sure that they can relay back to the drivers. If there's any problems, if someone runs out in the street, they're called observers. So you have to have special observer compartments. You have to make sure that the design in the front will work if uh, there is a problem with the mechanisms or mechanical problems with the float and it has to be towed. You have to make sure that everything's clear so that the float, a tow bar can be put in and the, the float can be um, towed. Um, it's just very, very different. Um, when I, when I normally do a rendering uh, for what you would see on what we would call the camera side of the float. And then as I draft the float, um, which again, I do on a board, um, it's just, it's easier for me. Um, most people would say that's not the case, but it, for me, it is. Um, I'll never forget uh, one of the gentlemen that La Cunata Float was taking my character designs and he would take all the different views and put them together to make a 3D. And he just, they told me on many occasions, they couldn't believe that they were, they exactly lined up. They had never been able <laughs> to see that before. Um, but I actually do overlays to make sure that that happens. Um, I'm, I, I really try to do that because those volunteers, they need to make sure that they have as accurate drawings as possible because they might start building it on one weekend, one little piece, and then they maybe they can't come back for three weeks. And then when they come back, they have to pick up where they were. So you want to make sure there's as much information for them as possible. But um, and then we do additional drawings that show the animation that's going to happen. So in all the drafting, uh, there's a special two or three pages at the end that show all of the animation that's going to happen. And uh, we want to make sure that when we do animation, this float has to go under bridges. It has to collapse down to get 
under things. And you also have to make sure that if in the case of an emergency, that everybody on the float can get off in a very quick um, manner. So there's a lot of things to take into consideration in that regard. But I'll mm -hmm. tell you, it is, there's nothing more magical than seeing a float go down the parade route on New Year's Day with the sun coming out and it's just beautiful. It's so much fun. Is, is that what you love most about it? Is that magic at the end of the ride to get there? Oh, yeah. It's um, the last few days. I, I can't remember um, not, you know, we don't have a New Year's because uh, or New Year's Eve, I would say, because we're always down at the float site finishing right. up right. final details and everything. And it's you're, you're up the last three or four days before <laughs> the parade down there day and night working, but it's so much fun. And once again, they're volunteers, but they're people you see year after year after year and you become friends with. And uh, they it's a time to catch up and renew friendships and see people you haven't seen in a long time. And it's it becomes a family. And um, for me, I, I just love experiencing things with other people. I like to, um, I, I like to uh, hear what other people are doing. And so for me, it's, it's just been so much fun. I, I try to find the fun in everything. And do you, so do you have one float that stands out for you as your favorite of all for one reason or another? Uh, there's, there's probably three or four, but uh, there was one years well, pick ago, two. pick two, that was two giraffes that were they were basically standing next to each other and they would literally twist their necks and kiss and that one was meant so much to me and that one did not win an award that year but it made the cover of every major newspaper in the united states <laughs> oh, wow because it didn't win <laughs> because it so didn't it got, win <laughs> it got more press but it was just it was just a really fun float and then we had another one, which was a pop-up book, which was an American, it was called the American History Book. And as it went down the parade route, this book would open up. It was a closed book that would open up and the front would cantilever out and everything popped up like a pop-up book. So you had the signing of the Declaration of Independence. You had all of these different articles of American history. And then you had fireworks that popped up and spun. And it was, it was just magical. And that was a time when, that was years and years ago. And there was a time where after the floats had been through the parade, they would set them up so that they would stop and people could come from all over to see them at the end of the parade route. But at that particular time, they would let the companies come down and run the floats for the guests. So my husband, who engineered the float, he's an amazing engineer. And um, his name's Michael. R R Renee won't say it, but Michael Johnson um, is a major engineer at the JPL and has put things into space and onto Mars and other places. Well, he is. He has always helped me on all these wonderful floats. And um, that one, he said, uh, he told me not to pitch it, but I did anyway, because I thought it was so much fun. And he said it was the first float he wasn't sure he could make happen. Oh. But it was so <laughs> beautiful. But the amazing thing was, is that he opened up a door on the side of the float so that the public could actually see it closing and opening and see how the mechanics yeah. work. Nice. Uh, they can't, they don't do that anymore due to safety. Um, but uh, it was really amazing that he was able to do that and share it with the, the people that were there to see. Well, that's, that's awesome. So I have been speaking here for a little more than an hour with uh, Renee Haas Johnson. Uh, and um, we're going to kind of wind this thing down. I'm just wondering, you've already told us some really great, funny stories, but do you have a particular story that you can think of that's weird, strange, quirky, odd, or also maybe just plain funny? Well, there's one. It it it. Uh, there's one that comes to mind. We were shooting in Denver, um, on remote, and uh, I had decided to design a set that was an enormous lodge, and we created a 18 foot tall fireplace, and so the mantle of the fireplace was well above Pat and Vanna's heads, and uh, so we had it was an enormous fireplace and. Obviously, we had to put a fire in the fireplace. So 
we were doing our final rehearsals and everything the day before the audience was going to come in and they called me because we had to do a final fire marshal walkthrough so we have the fire marshals there and I'm walking through with them and I always did the final walkthrough in case there were any problems anywhere backstage or on stage I could let everybody know and we could correct them so we're walking along in the backstage area and we come out in the audience area and all of a sudden fire marshal picks up his 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 radio and he's calling everybody and all this chaos is going on and I'm not quite sure what's going on and he goes, we're just going to have to shut you down. And I said, what do you mean you have to shut us down? He goes, that fire, look at the fire. You guys can't just put a fire in that fireplace. I mean, you can't do that. And, and all these firemen are coming from everywhere. <laughs> and we took them up on the stage and they realized it was a video wall. But they, they couldn't tell the difference. They, they said it looked so real. They'd never seen on any set anything look more real than that fireplace that they were positive it was real. And uh, so they all laughed and uh, it was it was really funny. I, so, I take it I take it they let you proceed at that point. Yes, they did. And they 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 just really laughed and they turned around to our producers that were there and the director I think had come out and said, boy, you guys got us. You guys got us. <laughs> that, 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 that's a that's a good and fun thing, isn't it? It, it, it was a lot of fun. You know, we, we've experienced so many things on the road and I'll just tell you, uh, it, it's been such a gift because everyone, every place we've gone has been nothing but kind. And there's so many people we've met in the entertainment industry and every, all of them are just so happy to be doing what they're doing and to be a part of it is really exciting. Well, that's great. Um, all right. So last question for you today, Renee. Um, You've already given us some spectacular advice, but I'm wondering if you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you can give to those who are maybe starting out or maybe they're, they've managed to break in a little bit, but they're trying to get to the next level. My first piece of advice would be to never make stuff up on your resume. Always be true to yourself because it's a very, very small industry and everyone knows everybody. And um, always be honest um, but always make sure that everyone knows that you want to learn. Whenever you're putting your portfolio together, always make sure you include pictures with you in the set. If you're a scenic artist, have someone snap a picture of you painting that set piece. If you're a customer, have somebody take a picture of you working on that costume, because that gives you things to talk about with people as you're being interviewed. You can talk about processes you might have learned or something like that. Um, and Whatever you do, don't ever give up. There will always be someone. If you can't work with someone, write a letter to a production designer or to someone in your field. And in a lot of cases, we all believe in giving back. We will all help whenever we can along the way. And so even if it's just a bit of advice, giving you an idea of someone else that you can contact or um, helping you to go to find the school that you should go to, et cetera, we're all there. The other thing is, is that a lot of people don't know, but a lot of the trade unions and the television, the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences and the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences all have apprenticeships and internships for people coming out of school. But even if you've already graduated, they have apprenticeships that you could get into. And in a lot of cases, even if you are not hired after that apprenticeship or internship, they can recommend people that you could work for. And I guess the last thing would be, don't mind taking a job that isn't exactly what you want on a film or a television show or in your industry, because it all can take you to where you wanna go at the end. So just be happy, enjoy the job and do the best you can and people will notice. And all those people will be the ones that you work with on your next job or help you get to your next job. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very, that's three very solid pieces of advice for anyone who's trying to get into design, production, uh, tech, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's really excellent. R Renee Haas Johnson, what a lot of fun today. I'm so glad that you uh, were able to spend a little time with me on Storybeat, and I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on the show today. Well, thank you. It's been a lot of fun, and I, I hope it was helpful to a, to a few people along the way. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. 
If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.